that's probably it, meaning that uh, now I'm on. Okay, so this is the um, third lecture of uh, CSE 547, the uh, discrete mathematics course. Are there any questions technically um, about anything we've been doing or logistically? Again, all of you out there in TV land should feel very free to ask questions. You're not actually on the, the, the film, and I would like to be interrupted if there's any questions or anything that we have. Okay? So any, any questions from past homeworks or from, from past classes or anything in the future? Okay, if not, um, we have start, been talking so far about, um, we, we, we've been talking a little bit starting last class about um, solving summations. Okay, and uh, we saw that there was a connection between summations and recurrence relations. And um, summations tend to get difficult when there are nested summations. That's sort of where um, things get particularly tricky. Okay, and when you're analyzing algorithms, nested summations come up fairly often. Okay, um, so for example, if you want to um, analyze an algorithm where there's nested loops, okay, Nesting loops is a lot like basically nested, nesting summations. Uh, to analyze the nested loops, you're analyzing nested summations. So you typically get expressions that look something like this. This is what you're probably familiar with. Something that says you've got an index j goes from 1 to 3, k goes from 1 to 3, of ai a times bk, aj times bk, okay? So the way to think about it is you have an inner loop. The inner summation is an inner loop that varies first. The outer summation varies slower than that, okay, is the way to think about it. And so the right way to evaluate a summation is from the innermost sum out back. Um, sometimes when you see um, the notation that we'll use in this class, you'll see something written like this, where you'll see, um, you know, sort of, we've got that j and k both lie between 1 and 3. And you may have both of these things written underneath the summation sign as follows. Okay, I hope this is, maybe I'll make it a little bigger so you can see. Okay, but um, the important thing to see here is that when you have two variables under a summation sign, do not be deceived. This is really two summations. Okay, and um, it's important to know when one index is being meant or when, you know, when, when you're summing over one variable or two variables to make sure you get that right. Both of these notations, I claim, would denote a sequence of nine terms, okay, where the terms correspond to all possible combinations of the index i, j running from 1 to 3, and k running from 1 to 3. So it represents, if we look at this thing summing in on the inward way most, this is a1 times, okay, b1 plus b2 plus b3, because that's the inner loop going around, plus change j to b2, b2, you know, a2 times b1, b2, b3, and so on. Okay? So any questions about what we mean by a nested summation? This, I suspect, is con many of you have seen before and shouldn't be too surprising. But it's important to make sure you get the semantics of what the sigma sign means. Okay? The important thing when you're solving a summation, okay, again, the solving, in some sense, a nested summation, in the best case, is no different than solving a regular single summation. If you can work from the in, from the out, if you can solve single summations, and you can always solve any single summation, then in some sense, multiple summations are no harder. Okay? You can always think of solving a multiple summation as being working from the innermost sum, solving that, and then taking the results of that and passing it to the next outermost sum. The trick, though, is sometimes summations cannot be done easily okay, by um, looking at the innermost sum and doing that one first. For that reason, there's various rules and techniques for switching the order of summation. Okay? And that's somehow the big trick or the big thing that makes multiple summations different than other summations. Okay, any questions about that so far? Okay, so um, again, if we look at this particular example, okay, where we have a sum, okay, as i goes from, um, here we have i and j both varying from 1 to 3 of ai bj, 
a, a, aj times bk. This we could write as the sum um, uh, over j on the outside and k on the inside, okay? And then figure out how to sum these terms, okay, in terms of j. Using the Iversonian notation I mentioned last time, instead of thinking this as being um, where, we're summing, where, we, where we specify our constriction on the indices as being down below, we could interpret them as being these terms out here which multiply, which evaluate to be 1 if j is in that, if, if the condition is true, and 0 if that condition is false. So another way to think, interpret the sum here, okay, would be to sum over all integers j and k, the value of aj times bk times the logical variable j between 1 and 3 times the logical variable k between 1 and 3. Okay? Any questions about the notation? Well, how can you work on this? Well, the, 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 the main trick somehow to solving these things in the vanilla case would be that um, the innermost index is k. We could pull out anything that is not dependent upon k out of the summation. Okay, so we could pull out the aj term to the previous point in the summation. We can pull out the logical term in Solving j outside that to earlier in the summation and end up with a sum that looks something like this. The innermost sum would be the sum of bk, okay, as over all values that k is defined. Once we have that, that's an isolated term. We can evaluate that sum. That is basically just the sum of these things. We could now pull this quantity outside the innermost sum, the sum over all j of aj from y goes to 1 to 3 is simply this thing. Okay? And lo and behold, what this says is that the sum of all these pairs of terms, okay, for any sequence a and b, is going to be the sum of the sequence, first sequence times the sum of the second sequence. Okay? Any questions about what this means? for what we've done so far. The important thing to see from the point of view of understanding summations is it's easy for you, there's nothing conceptually harder in this sum about summing up as j is the innermost sum, summation, and versus k is the innermost summation. Because there's nothing that depends on both a and j, between k, j and k, okay? In general, so long as the indices are independent, you can flop the order of them as you wish. Things get trickier when the in indices are not independent. Okay? Any questions? Now something that might be more interesting, or just to take a look at these things, when you look at a sum and you get a kind of interesting identity, here we've got an identity um, which says that if you take two sequences, okay, there's nothing in, in this that depended on the upper index being three. This said that you have two indices um, J and K both run up to N. You have two sequences of length N, let's say. This sum expresses the, the sum of all products of the terms, uh, of, of all pairs of terms, where you pick one from the first sequence and one from the second sequence. That's really what this sum is saying. And this says, as a result of this derivation, that the sum of all those terms is really the same as summing up all the terms in the first sequence and multiplying that by the sum of all terms in the second sequence. Can anybody see a quick reason for believing why that identity is true, independent of actually doing the sums? Okay. Can anybody see why this identity sort of has to be true? Come up with a proof that is sort of a, a slick by interpreting that proof. Anybody want to volunteer? Any questions? The way that I interpret it, when you have a nice reduction like that, there might be a way of interpreting it. I would interpret it something like this. Suppose we have our sequences A. We have A1, A2, and A3. And we have our sequences B1, B2, and B3. 
This thing asked us for the sum of all products of pairs of, of, na of different terms, correct? So what is the sort of size of that product? Well, one of those nine terms is going to be this thing. And one of those nine terms is going to be that thing, the product of this times this. And the other thing times B1 is going to be that thing. Can anybody now see a reason why this sum might work? Okay. If you interpret the product as being area, remember the area of a box that's B1 by A1 on a side is going to simply be A1 times B1. Correct? So a way to think of what that sum is really saying, if you look at it, is saying that here you've got, you want to take the sum of all the areas of terms, for things, all, all the products of something from the first term times something of the second term. If you look at a picture like that, this is a proof that it's correct. The sum of the area of the entire box is clearly going to be the sum of the height of this times that. It should be clear to you now that the sum of the heights of the boxes times the sum of the width of the boxes is going to be equal to the sum of the areas of each individual box. Okay, how many people see why that proof does what I say it does? And how many people are mystified by what, where I come up with boxes from summations? Okay, no one admits to being mystified. The key thing about this is, or the reason why that might be marginally interesting, is again, when you have a nice looking formula, okay, there are a couple of ways you can prove such things. One is often by going through and doing grungy manipulation of indices. The other is trying to look for some kind of a combinatorial interpretation, some kind of another reason to explain it. Okay? And the proofs that are usually have the most insight are the ones where you look for some other kind of explanation. Okay? And that's sort of the, 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 the sort of just the, 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 the regression here. That that's the kind of thing that ideally you should be looking for. Manipulating algebra hopefully requires relatively little thinking. But sometimes you can interpret results, you can, you can get the answers by doing more thinking and less algebra. Any questions? Okay. So doing sums where the indices are um, independent is relatively easy. Okay, you can do it basically one level at a time. Now for certain sums, okay, the indices are not independent. What do I mean by not independent? Okay, well, here you have j goes from 1 to n, k goes from j to n. Okay? Could you just flip this thing outside and say k goes from, from j to n on the outside? Well, no, because you need to know what the value of j is. And j is being defined by the outer thing. It's like, you know, nested loops. Okay? So let's look now, how could we um, solve something? Okay? If we wanted to write this in Iversonian notation, we could again think of this as being a sum over all values of j and k of j, a, j, k times j between 1 and n, k between j and n. This is a straightforward translation of this into the summation, into the Iversonian notation sign. Nothing interesting has happened. But what is interesting is that there are identities that you can use, okay, on Iversonian, you know, by manipulating an Iversonian notation, where if you can be convinced that the product of two Iversonian terms is something else, you could replace it by the identity. My claim is, if you look at this term carefully, saying that j is between 1 and n, and k is between j and n, is exactly, this is, this is going to be, this product of this times this is going to be 1 when both of them are true, and 0 when, neither, when, when either of them is not true. That's what the Iversonian notation means. I claim this is an, a, an equivalent thing, okay? Let's say that k lies between 1 and n, and j lies between 1 and k. Why are they equivalent? 
Let's try to think about this, because this, these kind of things tend to be tricky. This here says, if I interpret this, j can be anywhere from 1 to n, but j has to be less than or equal to k. This enforces that j is less than or equal to k, and k is less than or equal to n. Well, k could not have been gotten, gotten greater than, k, k was not allowed to be greater than, if k was greater than n, both these terms will be 0. Okay? If j is less than 1, okay, both these terms will be 0. Okay? This will be true if, in addition to those two constraints, j is less than k. And sure enough, this is true if j is less than k. My claim is by a careful, obs you know, by, 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 by convincing yourself of it, both of these terms are identical, true, you know, these, these things are true. They specify the same set of constraints on pairs of indices j and k. That said, if once you're convinced of that, we could replace this, okay, this over here by this. That basically tells us that the sum as j goes from 1 to n, k goes from j to n, of this is the sum as k goes from 1 to n, j goes from 1 to k. Okay? Any questions about what we just did? Okay? It might be perceived as tricky, because it is tricky. Okay? But really what we've just done is we found a way to rewrite the order of summations. Okay? And the trick is to find an alternate um, expression of the Ivers, you know, expression to represent, a way to write somehow the same pair's constraints. Any questions about that, about what we did? Okay. How many people sort of see how that worked? Okay. How many people don't see how it worked? Okay. Any comments? Yes, question. It should be the case, okay, in general, that for any, I, I, I think it's fair to say, uh, uh, without, without a proof in my head, it's almost certainly true that you could find an alternate set, a way to order the um, indices. Okay, if you given two nested sums, you can almost certainly reverse the, um, I mean, my, my, my sense is you could always reverse the order of summations if you use the right, um, you know, if, 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 if you're careful enough with how you do it, okay? So the bottom line is you should be able to do the conversions. Question. Okay. Okay, so what, yeah, I think we, what, what, what you're saying now is the question is, is there a better way to prove the identity of this? Okay? And I guess what, what, um, what I think is what you're saying, which actually is an interesting question, one way to think of it may be, if we think about this as a graph of an xy plot, okay, you could kind of think that any pair, let's say you have a pair of summations. For any pair of summations, there's certain routes, certain pair things that are being used to um, be described. Okay, and you want to sum up over all the selected dots. Reversing the order of summation is really a question of instead of reading the dots like that, reading the dots like that. So that's sort of a soft, that, that's, 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 let's say, almost a proof, okay? That, that would say that you always should be able to, in principle, reverse orders of summation. Whether it does you any good is not clear, okay? Whether it actually um, is easy to come up with an alternate way to sort of describe those terms is not clear. But conceptually, what you're doing when you're reversing orders of summation is changing the, basically changing the way you're reading the terms that you're talking about. Any questions about that? OK, good. So the point of doing this, the point of reversing the orders of summation, OK, is that certain sums are easier Okay, if you um, reverse, basically if you reverse them, okay? And in general, um, let's look at now some examples of sums that, um, you know, 
if, by cleverly manipulating the indices of what we're doing, we can do something interesting. Okay? Let's think of, first of all, what's a, the following sum. We have a sum where we've got two indices, j less than k, so there's no equality allowed. j is allowed to be, go from 1 to, what's the largest value that j can take on, by the way? Just looking at, in terms of how to read this sum. n minus 1, and what's, a lot, what's the smallest value k can take on? Okay. So another way to write that, if we wanted to, we could say that j goes from, you know, I mean, somehow it does, it does force us certain constraints. We know j is always less than k. This says that k, a, k, we have some sequence of terms a and some sequence b. This wants to know for all values k greater than a, what is a, k minus a, j times b, k minus b, j. Okay? Any questions about what the summation means? Okay. Let's think about how we can solve this thing. Okay. My first claim is this is our definition. Let's say that that sum is S. I claim that we could, by simply rewriting our terms, okay, by changing the vari we can do a variable substitution to this thing. What happens if we substitute, change the role of J and K in this expression, okay? Here, we're just going to substitute wherever we saw a j, 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 replace it by k. Actually, hold on. Am I, am I right? Every time we saw a j, we replaced it by a k. Every place we saw a k, 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 we replace it by a j. What we've done here has done absolutely nothing to change the summation. It should be clear that, that, that the value of this thing, okay, is exactly the same as the original value, okay? Changing variables right now hasn't really necessarily looked like it's done anything, okay? But let's think what that actually means, okay? What's interesting about this is that if you look at this thing, what's different between this side and this side? Suppose we now take this term j and k, aj and hk, and reverse it, and kj, k, bk, and bj, and reverse it here. What is the effect of taking a term, a, you have a pan where you have x minus y, and replacing that by y minus x? In order to do that in a sum, what you're really doing is you're multiplying the whole value by minus 1, correct? If you look at this, something cute happened, okay? By reversing this pair, we multiplied the expression by minus 1. By reversing this pair, okay, by that, we get minus 1. In fact, this expression is exactly the same as the original, okay? That should be quite believable. What's interesting about this? This is now kind of cute. If you look at this, this is the exact same sum as before, okay, except that the indices are different, correct? How can we make use of that? Well, my claim is, if we add this sum to that sum, since they add up to the same thing, we're going to get 2 times s, where s is the sum. I claim a way to add it is, let's take a look at all possible values of j and k with this same term over here, but add the Iversonian notations. So we're going to add this thing whenever j is less than k is less than or equal to n. Is this readable from where you are? No. Okay, so let me rewrite it again. This is the Iversonian notation for that, correct? Less than j, less than m, n. This is the Iversonian notation for that. This is the Iversonian notation for that. My claim is that adding up these two 
is the same as taking the sum of the Iversonian notation here, sum of the Iversonian, the Iversonian notation there plus there, and multiplying that by the sum. For each term in this sum over all possible things, the twice the sum is either going to have it zero times, meaning that neither of these was true. It's going to add this term twice if it, the i and j happen to pull in, happen, if, if i and j happen to satisfy both of them, and it'll be added there once if it satisfies one of them. Okay? Any questions? Okay. I claim that this is, this is fairly obviously true. What's cute about it is let's look at what this expression means. Again, it may not be very readable. This says, give me a 1 whenever j is less than k. This says, give me a 1 whenever k is less than j. Under what conditions will these things give me a 1? This will give me a 1 whenever j is less than k. This will give me a 1 whenever k is less than j. Under what conditions will those give me 1s? Is there ever a time when both of these things are going to be true? The answer is no. Under what conditions won't they be true? Well, the only times when I and j and k okay, are, both here, are both within 1 and n, when it is not going to be, when one of these sides is not going to be true, is if they happen to be equal. Correct? Because if j is less than k, this will light up. If k is less than j, that will light up. If they're equal, neither of them lights up. And my claim, therefore, is that the sum of these two is equal to the sum of jk running from 1 to n minus jk equals n. And this is now an alternate way to express that constraint. Any questions about that? I claim that you, this is a, a natural identity to see. Okay, once you, you should be able to see it. This is not that mysterious, and if not, I'll be happy to explain. Okay? But that means that we could now replace this thing by that. Any questions? Including a question of, like, how do you show that? Is sort of, well, why is that true? Is a good question. No questions. Why is that true? Good question. Okay? Think about what it's actually counting. This is, says that it's this term, if we know how to interpret this side, this is going to be, this sum is going to be 1 whenever j is not equal to k, provided j and k are both between 1 and n. That's what this side means. Okay? That's exactly what it says. Okay? That either if j is greater than k or k is greater than j. This will be 1 under those conditions. This side says, okay, give me 1. Make this 1 whenever j and k lie with 1 and n, except for the times when j is equal to k. Okay? And that is exactly the situation, same here. This is going to be 1 except when they are equal. This is going to be 1 all the time except when they are equal. Okay? Therefore, this is equal to that. Any questions? Okay. Takes a little cleverness to see it, but again, once you've got the identity now, it should be clear that this is true. What can we do with that? Well, now let's think what we've got. Um, this we could now break down. Here we now have this sum over all values of j, except now we're constraining it to the case where um, we, we now have these two sums, if you want to think of it. It's this minus that. Okay? So I claim we can break, use this to break our summation into aj minus k times bj minus k times a j minus a j minus k b j minus k okay because here was the case where we had all possible values here we only had the indices where j was equal to k 
But look at what we gained from this. If j is equal to k, what is aj minus ak equal to? Zero. So this is going to be zero times zero. We're adding up a bunch of zero times zero, zero, zero times zeros. No matter how many of them we add up, we still have zero. So this whole term can drop away from the expression. That's what we've gained. We now have a relatively simple sum where j and k are independent. Okay. We can now multiply out these terms. Two of those terms are going to be positive. Okay, we're going to have basically this times this and this times that. And two of those terms are going to be negative. We can break up the positive and ter negative terms and regroup. And this is fairly now easy to solve. First of all, this sum here, j goes k independent, aj times bk plus ak times bj, this sum was exactly the one I worked out earlier. So this sum is clearly going to be the sum of all the a values, I should still draw it here, since you, times the sum of all b values. And in fact, the fact that we've got two of them, these are identical, we can sort of say this is two times the sum of that, this we know how to solve, that's easy. On the other side, what do we have? Okay. We have the sum of aj and ak. If we think about it here, j and k are equal. Okay. Again, we've got two analogous sums. Here, we have the sum over j goes 1 to n, k goes 1 to n, of aj, bj. k goes 1 to n, j goes to n, then bk, nk. These two things are identical. I claim is we could replace this by two times the sum of one of them. Any questions about that? The more tricky part is, what is the sum of one of them? Let's now expand this thing out to have two indices. We could sum up over the j's or the k's first. If we sum up over, let's say we, let's say we, do, we, we got rid of the j's and replaced that by the two. My claim is there's nothing in here that depends upon the j's. If we make the j's the innermost summation, then we're going to have a sum. We could factor everything else out of that, okay, and be left with j goes from 1 to n, the sum of 1. What is the sum of 1 as j goes from 1 to n? n, okay? So now we've got an n that can go out in front of the sum. My claim is now we're left with a sum. 2n twice the sum is going to be 2n times the sum over, as n goes from 1 to n, of the diagonal elements of each sequence, minus twice the sum of these elements here. Okay? And this I claim is a much neater and, and, and this, this I claim is a different and interesting sum. We obviously have to divide by 2 to finish the job, okay? But again, the point was that we could get insight into the sums by manipulating the indices until the sums were independent, and then doing the sums as we wished. Any questions? Okay? I always think that doing algebra, watching people do algebra, is about as boring a thing as you can watch, okay? And I realize that, okay? Something you've got to sit down and convince yourself of what these steps actually are to make any sense of it. And I urge you to go back, you know, after class, go through these examples, see what it is, try the homework examples, work out those sums. That's how you get a handle of these things. Any questions? What I'd like to show you now is something that's not in the book, but I think might be interesting, is a sort of application of summation that I once did, okay, or that I was once involved with. In fact, actually, it, was, it, it turned out there was a project a graduate project in um, this course several years ago. So maybe this will give you some idea of what a good graduate project is like. Okay? And it will also give you an idea of how being able to do summations, okay, you can you know, maybe learn something. A, a lot of the times the problems you, you see when you take a class like this or in a class is somebody gives you a summation and they say solve it. 
That, again, I, we can talk to our industrial representatives back in Syosset, but I suspect none of you have ever been given a sum and told to solve it for a living, have you? Not recently. Not recently, okay. But there are situations where, again, do you do a sum, okay? It's because somehow it, it comes up in the course of something you're modeling, okay? And let's look at an example of where I was given, you know, a, a problem walked in the door, and um, we ended up solving it using a summation. What was the problem? Again, many of you are familiar with Professor Kaufman in the computer science department, and he, he's, he has a very large graphics lab, and a graphics, his research involves volumetric graphics, okay? Um, one of the um, aspects of volumetric graphics, if you want to think of it, is they view the world as being constructed of discrete three-dimensional pixels. That's where the voxels come from. A pixel you know is sort of a square on a screen. Certain squares touch each other, okay? Certain squares don't. One of the issues that comes up in graphics, both in three, two dimensions and three dimensions, is a question of how you draw a line, okay? Um, and there's different kinds of ideas for how to draw a line between two different places, okay? Or measure the distance between two different places on a grid. Here, let's say we've got a grid sampled like this. I claim we can talk about um, the distance across that grid in a couple, under a couple of different metrics. One way to measure the distance from here to here is what we would call the Manhattan distance. How many blocks does it take you to walk that distance? In Manhattan, you know that you can go either left, either down a street or up a street. Okay? And so if you want to go to some place that's five blocks over and then three blocks up, well, you have to walk eight blocks. That's the Manhattan distance between two points. You can't go through buildings because buildings are in the way. Okay? Now, on the other hand, there's other notions of distance that might come up in, um, you know, in, in the course of um, analyzing lines. So, for example, maybe we would say, okay, instead of a Manhattan cost of two to go across a diagonal, maybe we allow you to go across a diagonal in one move. So the distance from here to here, if we allow you diagonal moves, might be one, two, three, four, five steps instead of eight. Okay? My claim is that there's different distance metrics across a diagonal, a grid, depending upon what kind of neighboring moves you're allowed. Okay? The Michael Jordan metric, maybe you could jump all the way in one step. Okay? But that's not what we're considering. Okay? Any questions by what we're trying to do? So I claim that if you take a pair of grid points, okay, how far apart they are depends upon what metric you use. Okay? And the question Professor Kaufman came to me with was, he wanted to know under two different types of distance metrics, if you pick random points in a n by n by n cube, how far apart were they on average? Okay, how did the distance metrics differ in terms of measuring how far apart they were? For he had an interest that some metrics he was able to do something good with, some metrics he couldn't do something with. Okay? And he wanted to convince himself that the metric he could do something with wasn't that much different than the metric that he couldn't do something with. Okay? So he wants to now know, for a gift, picking two random points in a grid, what is the expected value of their distance, the ratio of their distance metrics? Okay. Any questions about that? So this is a problem he walked into the office with. And I claim that, in fact, you could compute this thing exactly by doing a sufficiently complicated summation. What could we do? Well, let's say that we have two points picked at random, means that we could pick any point. A point x, y, z, okay, let's say our point p is going to have the x, y, and z are going to vary from 1 to n. A point q is going to have x, y, and z vary from 1 to n. I claim if we sum up over all possible choices of x, y, and z, x1, y1, z1, 
and x12, y2, z2, okay? For each one of those six indices, compute the distance measure of, under metric A, the distance of that, divide it by the distance function for the second metric. Add those things up and divide by the number of points, which was nq, into the sixth, and number of, of, of samples we're doing. This, I claim, would give you the average ratio of these two different metrics for points picked randomly on an n by n by n grid. Okay? Any questions about that? What we're trying to do? Okay? So I claim that this now become, reduces the computation down to a problem of computing a sum that is six levels deep. Okay? And that would then give you the answer that you want. Okay? Any questions? Well, look, let's look at that a little bit closer. Okay? Just for sort of getting some feeling for this. First of all, what are the kind of distance metrics that these guys were interested in? They were interested in um, the distances that you would get by, for example, the Manhattan distance. Okay? So suppose, let's say, we consider the sixth distance is what we mean by the three-dimensional um, uh, okay, three um, Manhattan distance, if you want to think of it. What does that mean? That says that the distance between two points would be the difference between their x-coordinate the difference between their y-coordinate and the distance between their z-coordinate. Okay? You have to walk x blocks over, y blocks across, and take an elevator. Okay, z blocks. Okay? The reason it's called six distance is you can think of it as being a cube where from any point you're allowed to move one of six places. You could move to the left, you could move to the right, you could move forward, you could move back, you could move up or you could move down. That's why they call it the sixth distance. Any questions? A more general thing would allow you to take a move in any direction. You could move to any one of your neighbors. Okay? If you want to move to any one of your neighbors, how many neighbors does a cube in three dimensions have, if you stop and think about it? Well, there's the six immediate neighbors. There are, okay, now here I'm probably going get, to get, get wrong, there's going to be another 12 neighbors, which I think you share a side with. I mean, again, well, let's, um, let's try to get two dimensions, since that I could deal with. Here, if these were the immediate neighbors, there's certain other neighbors you could go to. Actually, if this was in three, three dimensions, there's certain neighbors that you share a side with. Let's maybe draw the cube in 3D, and this may be a problem. So here would be one neighbor. The cube out here, if I draw this right, which I'm probably not going to. This cube, I there's an edge with that. Okay? So when we talk about the, 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 the cubes either share a face, they share an edge, or there could be one sitting out just touching in that corner. And the different distance metrics they were interested in were whether or not, you know, where you were allowed one step in any one of either the six, 18, or unrestricted 26 different ways. Okay? The six distance, the Manhattan distance, we agree, was the sum of the differences in their coordinates. If you're allowed to jump arbitrarily to any neighbor, if you stop and think about it, like as in here, if I'm allowed to jump to any neighbor, it corresponds to whatever the number of steps is going to be, whatever the longer dimension is. Okay, so in fact, that would be the maximum of these three things. Okay? And something that isn't so obvious, but that the other dimension corresponded to either the maximum of um, the, 30, 30, the 26 distance and this kind of funny quantity. Let's not worry so much about that. So what could we do? Okay. 
Well, the first thing I could claim is that we could express this as being the sum of the six-dimensional sum of the ratio of any one of these over the ratio of any one of those. Now, what that ratio looks like is going to depend upon what those terms look like. If you have something like the six sum distance over the 26 distance, the terms you're summing up are going to be fairly easily broken up into three simple sums. Okay? So summing up something like this shouldn't be frightening. Okay? This is going to reduce to sort of sums of just ratios, and that's straight, very straightforward. A sum that looks something like this, where you're summing up terms like this, should look a little bit more frightening because you can't break, if you have a sum, sum, sum of x, y, and z, you can't break this into three quantities. But in fact, I claim that this, this kind of ratio will eventually reduce to harmonic numbers. Okay? You don't have to believe me on that. But I'll, I'll claim that there's some element of summing over ratios. Maybe there's some hope that harmonic numbers will come up. Okay? So what I claim was that actually if you take these metrics, you take the space of the cube and break it up into regions, you could express what that ratio is as the sum of quantities that can be relatively easy, straightforwardly computed. Okay? Any questions about what we're doing so far? The other trick that I just want to mention from this Okay, is that summing up over six dimensions seems like a nasty problem. This is a six-way nested sum, because you're nesting up over all possible coordinates of the first point times all possible coordinates of the second point. Okay? In fact, by being clever, we could reduce our sums down to a three dimension three nested sums, which is much more easy. How is that? I'm trying to sum up over all possible pairs of points what the distance is, the ratio of those distances. I claim that instead of summing up over all possible pairs of points, one thing I could do is say that, that one of my points is always fixed in the origin and simply account for every, how many times each distance occurs. So if you stop and think about it a little bit, okay, instead of considering all possible, the, the, the impact of all possible rays that are, uh, segments that are one point to the x and two to the y, I could sum up over all possible starting points, which were three indices, or I could compensate for that after the fact. Namely, I claim that the number of possible ways you could have this particular coordinate in a grid is there's as many st possible starting points of x coordinates sufficient so it doesn't bang off the outside of my grid and sufficiently number y coordinates that I could move it up without going outside my grid. My claim is I could consider pair as b being from the origin to a particular x, y, z point and simply multiply it by an appropriate factor to count how many times that thing happened. Okay? And by doing this, I was able to get rid of the extra three summations. How many people see why I got rid how I got rid of the three summations? How many people are completely lost at this point? Okay? The lost people have it. Okay? But what I still claim, I don't want to necessarily um, dwell on this, so you can try to figure it out. What I claim is, if you finish this thing, you end up with a bunch of summations that can actually be, quote unquote, obviously solved. Okay, and um, let's just to show you some gruesome quantities. Here is what one of the sums reduced to in two dimensions. Okay, you had two nested sums. Okay, and lo and behold, when you work it out, you get a nice, reasonable quantity. In three dimensions, let's zoom it in. Again, you can get a sum where you break it into cases, and lo and behold, you've got three nested sums. By repeatedly peeling off each one, 
you can end up with a corresponding quantity. And ultimately, we were able to work out exactly what the, um, oh, sorry, excuse me, exactly what the um, quantities, was that, um, did something bad change here? Or is this now what it was? Okay. What we now have is um, we could show for every ratio of distance metrics, work out exactly what that ratio was. And so it was kind of interesting. They were both experimental results that they had gotten, and we worked out the exact constants, and they were not that far from what their experiments had actually shown. But it was kind of amazing to see that the number that they thought was uh, 0.96 was really 84 over 5 log 3 minus 84 fifths log 2 minus that. Okay? Anyway, just keep that in mind. Okay, so what's the point? We modeled something as a sum. Once you have it as a sum, once you've done the modeling, a lot of the techniques that we'll show make it basically mechanical to solve it. This was gruesome. But in fact, these computations, the actual summations were done by a computer instead of somebody on a scratch paper. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit later. Any questions? OK, sorry about that digression. Let's look at um, a couple. Um, let's look at one more. Um, gruesome example and then we'll uh, we'll try to sort of wrap this thing up here is um, not, not wrap it up so fast but okay let's look at a sum where changing the order of summation does some interesting things for you okay and this is an example from the book which is interesting because it shows that eventually if you work hard enough to change the order of summation something good happens what is the sum the sum is k goes from j, k goes from 1 to n, j goes from 1 to less than k of k minus j. Okay? If I was given this sum, how would I proceed? Okay? One thing that's true is when you have 1 over k minus j, that's an ugly thing to have in the denominator. How can you get rid of it? Well, you could do a variable substitution. Every place you see j, replace it by k minus j, k minus j by some variable. I claim you can reduce that by some, just by changing the indices. Now this, the inner sum goes, k minus j runs from 1 to k, and now we're summing up over j. This was a simple substitution. No magic involved with that. Any questions about why this works? Okay, so now we're just changing the words k minus j to be j, and then seeing what the implications are. Once we've got that, now we've got a sum in here that goes from k minus j, goes from 1 to k. That's kind of weird to think about. If you rethink about it a little bit, by subtracting, uh, you could think of that as being that j goes from 1 to k minus 1. Actually, why is that? Let's think what this means. Okay, we know k goes from 1 to n. How could we simplify this thing? This says that j, okay, here this is sort of a bound on, okay, this says that k minus j is less than k. Okay? That means that we're allowing ourselves any value of j that goes from 0 to k minus 1. Any value j that is, le that is greater than 0, because there has to be a difference between k minus j and j. And we have to insist that, um, that, that, that it be less than k. So I claim this expression is analogous to j between k and y 0 and minus one, k minus 1. How many people see why that is? How many people don't see it? Okay. People who are reacting see it. So some like this, that I claim, you could replace that by a harmonic number, because you've got a sum of 1 over j, as j goes from 1 to that, that's the k minus first harmonic number. So that looks good. But now, basically, you're stuck. You don't know how, anything about how to do sums of harmonic numbers. And so you're stuck at this point. Okay, any questions? Yes. So, with, with 
So the question is, the question is here, could I have replaced j less than or equal to 0 less than j by j less than or equal to 1? And the answer is most definitely yes. Okay? Is it better to do it that way? It's the same thing. If you like it, better do it. Okay? Sometimes it may make things clear. Sometimes it might not make things clear. Okay? But it's the same thing. Okay? Any questions? Okay, good. Now, let's look and see what happens if um, we wanted to, since we got stuck, one technique might be to interchange the order of summation. Well, here we have k goes from 1 to n, j goes from 1 to k. That's the exact situation we looked at before. By using our Iversonian notation, let's maybe zip that thing up a little bit. Using our Iversonian notation, um, actually, that, 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 that looks better, right? OK, good. This gives us this kind of sum. What could we now do? Well, again, we now are summing on k, but this thing is still ugly. Let's replace k minus j by some other variable, k. So every time we see k, k minus j, we replace it by k. If, we have a, if we're replacing k minus j by, um, by k, anytime we add a k, that's now going to be k plus j. Okay. Any questions about that? It's basically just a sub substitution. It's a tricky thing to do. So in fact, if I were actually doing this kind of thing, I would probably do this by um, the following way. I would set outside, I'd maybe have some variable x, and say x equals k um, minus j. Then try to find some way to replace that x by it. If x equals k minus j, then k is going to be equal to then x plus j. And that's the way that you would see how that happens. Okay. Now what do we have? We now have an, a sum that's going from j as it goes from k plus j to n. Can we find some way to get rid of that and have the inner, the variable on the inside be right? My claim is that if k plus j is less than n, the largest value that k can be is n minus j. What's the smallest value that j can be? Uh, k can be well. It has to be greater than. It has to be strictly greater than j. Okay. No, actually, um, what do we actually know? We know that j is um, greater than or equal to k plus j. We know the smallest thing on j is one. One is less than or equal to zero. Um, okay. We could have this. Uh, okay. You have to get the, the lower index right. OK? Is it possible for, for k to be equal to 0? If k is equal to 0, what does that mean? We, OK, why could k be equal to 0? Can anybody see why k is equal to 0? OK. I see here that um, j is between 1 and n. We know that k, k has to be greater than that. I don't see any reason, frankly, why k, Oh, this is actually that k cannot be equal to 0. That's why we say k greater than 0. So right, k is equal to 1. Professor. Yes. Professor, why can't you just take the inequality j less than k plus j less than equal to n, subtract j everywhere, and you'll get 0 less than k is less than equal to n minus j. Okay. Like that, Easier to look at it that way? That may be an easier way to think about it. Okay? I confess I can't parse your identities standing up here. Okay? But, so what you're saying is basically you just wanted to subtract both sides, j from all sides. And that actually is really, right. I guess, the j right way. j gives you the 0, k plus j minus j gives you right. j, and n minus j gives you n minus So that's exactly what you did here was subtract j from all sides. And that actually will do the job too. Okay? I prefer to reason these things out because I get them very, very confused. Okay, that's why I say do this carefully. But if you do that, you're still sort of stuck. Okay, you've now got a sum of this. This is a um, harmonic number because it goes from zero to one to that of that. You've still got sums of harmonic numbers. You're no better off than you were before. So interchanging the order of summation there didn't really help. But in fact, if you're as smart as Knuth. There is actually a smarter way to do this sum. 
And it's sort of instructive to see that, that even though both of these techniques fail. Okay? Let's look at what we're doing. This is the sum as j goes, j less than k, of the sum of um, 1 over that, k minus that. We can now replace k by that. That's what we did before, in fact. What is the idea here? Let's now break this into two sums, okay, where, okay, let, this is actually the tricky step here, okay. Um, let's now, this says that j is less than k plus j, okay. We can now break this thing into a sum, k goes from 1 less than n, okay, so, so my claim is that there's an Iversonian identity here that says that that is equal to that. Let me show you on my next slide how that actually worked. Again, I only can work these things out, I'll confess, best by sort of just doing cases. What is the sum over these indices? Okay. What values of k can be taken on by this? If j is 1, Okay, what do we now know? For if j is 1, we know that k can go all the way up to n minus 1. If j is 2, this can go all the way up to n minus 2. So we know that these constraints limit ourselves. So k is between 1 and n minus 1. What values of j are legal? Okay, well we know that j has to be greater than 1 equal to 1 because of how that's done. What is the other constraint? Okay, if we take a look at this thing, we now know that j, okay, has to be less than or equal to, j, k plus j is less than or equal to n, okay? That says that j has to be less than or equal to n plus 1. My claim is j can run between 1 and n minus k, okay? And so if we think about it, an analogous way we could write this sum is as nesting the sum as k goes from 1 to n and j goes from 1 to n minus k. This is how I sit down and work these things out, okay, just because that's the way my mind works. Once you've got a sum like this, in fact, it now becomes relatively easy. Why? Because if you look at it, the innermost sum, there's no dependency at all on j in this expression. We can filter that thing out. We get 1, the sum as j goes from 1 to n minus k of 1, that is simply n minus k. We get the sum of n minus k over k of this. We can break that into two sums. The sum of this is n times the sum of 1 over k. That's a harmonic number. Otherwise, you get the sum of k over k, which is 1, n minus 1 times, we get that n times h sub 1, h, the n the minus first harmonic number minus n plus 1 is our sum. And this by doing some, you know, by um, simply noting that, that the difference between the nth harmonic number and the n minus first harmonic number is 1 over n, we could get rid of that 1 by noting that 1 is n times n over 1. 1 over n, we could break that 1 into n slivers, add that to that, and get us our final expression, n times the nth harmonic number, minus n. Okay? Any questions? Again, watching these sums, I don't feel know how, you know, the question of how illuminating these things are, I realize is somewhat open. Okay? But the, the moral here is if you bang on the sum and treat it different ways, some ways it can go, some ways it can't go questions. Okay. Now, I'd like to talk briefly about infinite sums, okay? One thing that, that uh, you've probably seen before is you summed up an infinite number of terms versus a finite number of terms. And this gets us to th issues of limits, okay? And this is a tricky business. To show you that it's a tricky business, let's look at two different summations. Suppose we have the sum s as it goes from, which is the sum of 1 over 
2 to the k as k goes from 0 to infinite. Okay? This sum is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth dot dot dot. I claim the following trick is kind of neat. Suppose we take all the terms in that sequence and multiply them by 2. That's going to give us twice the sum. That's going to give us 2 times 1, 2 plus 1 plus 1 half plus dot dot dot. This, if you look at it, is 2 plus the same infinite sum we had before. So what this says basically is that 2 times s is equal to s plus 2. Solving for that, we get s is equal to 2. Okay? It's a slick way to prove that. Okay? What about a slick way to prove the case where we don't have a minus 1 in the exponent? t is going to be the sum of all 2 to the k for all values k goes infinite. That can be written as 1 plus 2 plus 4 dot dot dot. 2 times this is going to be 2 plus 4 plus 8 dot dot dot. This is exactly the same sequence we had before except for 1, right? So that says 2t is equal to t minus 1. Solving for t, t is going to be equal to minus 1. And that shows that the sum of all positive integers, the all powers of 2, is minus 1. Okay? How many people believe that? Okay, one person believes it. Okay? But uh, I don't believe it. Okay? So the trick is to realize that you're doing something, you're, you're playing with fire when you're doing um, sums of infinite terms. Okay, that's the, the basic rule that I would use. Okay, and we need some kind of a definition to grant us under what condition is a, is a sum of an infinite number of terms well defined and what numbers are, what, what is ill defined. Okay, the definition we're going to use Okay. Again, you know, this is this is complicated stuff, and you can, you know, you you you, you know, you get into a lot of mathematics here. But basically, our definition we're going to use, we're going to say that a sum is well defined if we consider a sum of positive terms. It's well defined if there is some constant such that the sum of it for any subset of finite size, any finite size subset of those terms that the sum of that subset is less than our bound. Okay? Our sum is going to be well defined if there is some, sub, some bound over the sum of any subset of terms. Okay? And in fact, what we're going to say is the actual sum of an infinite series of positive terms is the smallest such a. Smallest such constant that, that for any subset we have, we realize it. So this is capturing the idea that, again, you have a series of sums, a series of terms. Add them up, they approach a limit. Okay? And, um, you know, again, you would not have any such... If we look at the last example, the example of, um, you know, summing up over um, all positive powers of 2, there's no... No matter what constant you pick, there is going to be some finite subset that's going to exceed it. That's why the sum technique breaks down there. Okay? Things get trickier, okay, when you have um, positive and negative sums terms, because they sometimes cancel. What is the sum as k goes from 0 to uh, infinity of minus 1 to the k? Okay? One way you could look at it is 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus that. If you pair them up like this, you get that the answer should be 0. If you pair them up starting from the second term, you get that the answer is 1. The value of this sum depends on whether infinity is even or odd, okay, which is not a good thing to deal with. Okay? So in fact, the pre but, our, but this kind of thing is ruled out by our definition. Why? I claim that no matter what bounding constant you pick for this sum, there is no constant you can pick such that for all subsets of terms, you can't find a subset of terms that adds up to that. If I pick every other one, it's going to add up to be an infinite number. And so if you pick, tell me, oh no, the limit's going to be A, I could pick A plus one of those ones and you're sunk. Okay? So that's sort of our um, 
general rules for, um, for dealing with these things. Okay, I'm not going to really go into too much detail. But basically, if we want to work on infinite sums, so long as the sum converges to this constant, as we've said, everything we've said will work. Okay? Otherwise, we're stuck, and we're not going to get into too much detail about that. The one case that's, that, that, that is more interesting is, again, when you've got both positive and negative terms. If you have positive and negative terms, the way, one way to deal with them is to th think about them as grouped by, group them by signs. If so, you've got an seri infinite series of positive terms and an infinite series of negative terms. If both of these approach limits, then we could solve them independently and deal with those limits. That makes sense. If one sum goes to infinite, is, becomes infinite, and the other one sort of becomes six, it's clear that the difference between them is going to grow out infinitely large. Okay? The case where you get into trouble okay, is only when both the positive terms and the negative terms diverge, okay, the sums of them. And if so, my, my only recommendation is you play around with them, try to get some kind of intuition, okay? Maybe to think about them as finite sums, okay? And prove something for finite sums. So like the sum of minus 1 to the k, n, k, as k goes from 1 to n, is a well-defined and easily solved sum. Any questions? Okay. Let me just conclude today with... Um, the general street map of, uh, let's say, roadmap of what you should do when you're given a sum. Or let's put it this way, what do I do when I'm given a sum? Okay? My first instinct is to cheat. Okay? What is the best way to, well, how do you, again, I don't want to teach you how to cheat, especially when the exams come up. Okay? But how do I work if I have a sum? If I can't solve it, my first goal would be to try to look up and see what the answer is. There's a couple of tools you should have at your disposal, which you may not be aware of, which are useful things. One is a book and a website called the Handbook of Integer Sequences. This is uh, my copy of the book. You're probably more interested in the website, which is available from the, co from the course webpage, but it's www.research.atnt.com, tilde njas. Neil J. A. Sloan, that's the guy who did it, slash sequences. And what this is, is a web page that if you give it any se sequence of terms, it will tell you if there is a sequence that somebody else has stumbled across that starts that way. So suppose like, you want to solve the sum. Let's think of what's, a, what's an interesting sum. Let's say we want to solve the sum um, um, uh, I, as I goes from 1 to N. Okay, I don't know how to do this. Okay, well, what is this, this term? Well, when I is equal to 1, when N is equal to 1, what do I get? That's 1. For N equals 2, what do I get? 3. What's the next one? 7. Next one. Okay, a, a 6. 15. If I didn't know how to solve it, I could take this sequence of numbers and feed it into the website that Sloan has and see what he tells you. Okay? And what you would be surprised at is how many sequences are on there. Okay? He's got a database of about 5,000 sequences that come up in mathematics a lot. Okay? And quite often if your thing comes up in a reasonable problem, okay, somebody else got there first. Okay? And so this is a t technique I urge you to play around with, okay? A second thing I urge you to play around with is that most computer algebra systems, be it Mathematica or Maple, or which I guess are the major ones on the market these days, have some kind of a package for solving sums symbolically, okay? So if you go to the appropriate package in Mathematica, certain sums, like some here, you know, if you feed I want to know the sum of 2 to the k as k goes from 0 to n. A symbolic solver, the Gos using Gosper's algorithm, which is described in the book, will return to you a symbolic form for that. Okay? So one thing to try to solve sums, which was used on the 
graphics example, okay, and other things, was that once you have the sum broken down neatly, okay, maybe you can feed it to a solver and it does something for you. I don't encourage you to do this on the homework, okay, although, I'm not, you know, I obviously can't stop you. The goal is to try to learn the techniques. But this is a good thing to do when you've got a tricky sum. On the other hand, quite often the program will come back, if it's a very tricky sum, come back and tell you, I can't do it, okay? So that's why, you know, so mechanical things it can do, okay? But things that require cleverness and insight, it can't. And that's one of the things that hopefully you can provide, okay? Any questions about these resources you have? What other things do I do if I have a, um, what you call it? If I, if I have a sum to try to do? Well... I look at some examples, I try to make a guess as to what it might be. Maybe Neil Sloan's sequence, it matches something in Sloan's handbook. Okay, and now he tells me what the answer is. Okay, or maybe I can get a pattern. At that point, you want to try to prove it by induction. Okay, induction is a mechanical thing, works a lot. A technique that worked on a lot of the sums that we saw here was this idea of taking the sum, giving it a name, Okay, just like what we did with the in solving the infinite series. We gave it a name, monkeyed around with the series till we saw it appear again, and then reused that name. Okay, that's what we mean by perturbation. And if you can do such a thing, we've seen this trick a couple times, that's a good idea. Last class, we talked about the repertory method. If you can convert your sum into a recurrence, maybe you can solve the recurrence. Okay, and that's sort of a, uh, you know, one possible technique. More esoteric things to try. Well, if you just want to get an idea of what it is, summations may be harder to do than integrals. Okay, so if you want to get a rough idea of what you're trying to do, if you replace your sigmas by integral signs, okay, if you remember calculus, it can give you some insight into what your sum probably is. The other technique, which is probably the one that I use, that's most commonly used, is you just sort of bang around and sort of expand and contract trying to find something, okay? And this is, again, this is sort of mindless search. This is what most people try to do. For that reason, I recommend trying to think about some of the higher level operations rather than just rummage around with that, okay? And finally, later in the course, we're going to talk about generating functions, okay? That's going to be a very, very powerful technique for solving recurrences, okay? And implicitly with that, lots of other sums. Any questions so far? Okay. Okay, if not, thanks for your attention. Um, look at the book, do the homework, and we'll see you guys next class. Thank you.